Hello, uh, welcome back. Today we're going to uh, be discussing post-World War II Europe. Uh, really, uh, we're, we're going to be talking about that and uh, by discussing uh, a series of conferences that happened during World War II that set up a post-World War II Europe, and really a post-World War II world. Uh, you know, we, we knew while World War II was going on that when it was over, when the Allies won, that there was going to be a serious amount of tension between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, the these two countries are going to come out of World War II both as superpowers and they have different visions for the world. And so, uh, and those different visions are going to be competing against each other. So uh, today we're really kind of discussing the decisions that were made during the war that are going to, uh, you know, be the context of uh, the Cold War uh, after the war. So uh, there's a series of conferences that we're going to be discussing. Uh, the conference at Tehran, Cairo, Yalta, San Francisco, Potsdam, and uh, Washington. So uh, the first conference that we're going to be discussing today is the uh, conference at uh, Tehran. Uh, the conference at Tehran, the biggest thing that comes out of the conference at Tehran is a commitment to Operation Overlord, which is the mainland invasion of, uh, of France during World War II. Uh, but there's uh, lots of uh, smaller things that are just as significant that are going to come out of Tehran. Uh, the conference at Tehran are going to be going to involve the big three: uh, Winston Churchill, right from Great Britain; FDR from the United States; and Joseph Stalin from the Soviet Union. Those are the three most powerful world leaders, right? So Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. Uh, the uh, like I said earlier, uh, the main point of Tehran is the discussion of opening up a second front uh, in Europe. Stalin is in uh, desperate need of that. Uh, he needs relief from the fighting on the Eastern Front, and so he's pushing for that. The uh, and. <clears throat> You know, the, the West has really been pushing that off for a, a significant amount of time. Uh, the Soviets uh, are, in, because Stalin is so desperate to get a second front, he's going to commit to entering the war with Japan as well, which is something that the United States really wants. Uh, the United States is uh, essentially going to sweeten the pot here too. Uh, they're going to... Uh, essentially to, to be able to get this pledge from the Soviets, they're going to agree to hand over uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia and essentially give them back to the Soviet Union. Uh, they're going to say, you, before that happens, there has to be a vote, but I think everybody knows that that vote will be, uh, you know, uh, rigged. So, we're going to hand that back to the Soviet Union. Uh, we're going to push the Polish border further west, uh, which is, again, uh, advantageous to the Soviet Union. And so we're all ready to get the Soviet commitment to open the second front against Japan. Uh, you know, we're already giving away portions of Eastern Europe to uh, Soviet control. <clears throat> the uh, there's still some disagreements over what's going to happen to Yugoslavia and Poland. Uh, remember the West, Poland went. Uh, po Poland is very important to the West. The West went to war to guarantee Polish sovereignty, and so you know uh, we really want Poland to be. Uh, you know, a, a democracy and to have its sovereignty. Uh, but Stalin, on the other hand, insists uh, that uh, 
you know, he needs Poland for a buffer zone from Europe, right? He's been invaded twice, essentially, through the that Polish territory, the Polish corridor, and he wants to stop that from happening again. So there's contention there, and that's going to be a big part of the Cold War later on. And also Yugoslavia. Uh, Yugoslavia will uh, actually end up eventually voting to be a communist uh, and, and will be a communist country, but will be rather independent from the Soviet Union. They're not, uh, the, the Yugoslavian government is not going to uh, do the bidding of the Soviets. So uh, some of these concessions, like I just said, uh, are going to lead to conflict with the uh, Soviet Union later, and again, it's the you know Poland is just a really big part of that. Uh, part of that, uh, they're also at this conference going to agree that Iran should be uh, a sovereign uh, nation as well. And so, uh, when that happens, the United States is going to back the Shah in uh, Iran, and that's going to lead to problems later too. Uh, we're going to be excited because the Shah is not a communist, and so we're going to support him. Uh, but the Shah is not a good dude. He's going to mistreat his people. And the Iranians are going to associate the United States with that mistreatment, which will ultimately lead to uh, the Shah being overthrown uh, and the Iranian hostage crisis uh, later on. We'll talk about that in discussions uh, you know, uh, in m- much later on. And so uh, there is all this conflict, uh, and you know uh, it's it's setting up a battle for Eastern Europe. So uh, the next big conference is going to be in uh, Cairo. And so this is going to include Shanghai Shek, FDR, and Churchill. Uh, this conference is going to be primarily about what's happening uh, out east, right? And so uh, it's not going to include Stalin. Uh, Shanghai Shek, right? We already know who FDR and Churchill are. Uh, Shanghai Shek is the leader of the uh, Chinese government, the nationalists. Remember, he is uh, being challenged in China by Mao Zedong, who is the communist. They're, they've essentially called a timeout on the Civil War uh, there. And so Shanghai Shek is in charge, uh, but his, uh, you know, his grip on China is rather loose. And so uh, it is at the Cairo conference that we're going to agree that Japan must uh, c- unconditionally surrender to end the war that, you know, those were the terms given to Ger- you know, those are the terms that we are offering Germany. And so it's going to be the same thing for Japan. Japan, it's going to be a little bit more difficult though, uh, because, you know, clearly we know from uh, previous lectures that there was one condition that was met that Hirohito will be able to stay in power. Uh, but we're, we're essentially laying on the line at Cairo and saying, look, when this war is over, uh, we're going to restructure things in Japan and you're just going to have to deal with that uh, if you want uh, the fighting to stop. We're also uh, going to try to strengthen Shanghai Shek by making sure that all the land that Japan took is given back to China, which should be a domestic victory for Shanghai Shek, right? Uh, You know, it should help him politically at home uh, being able to get all that land back. It won't, in fact, really help him politically. The Chinese people are upset that he lost the land in the first place uh, and, you know, many other reasons. The Shek government is corrupt and they're, they're issues there. Uh, But uh, we're going to give all the land that Japan took back to China. And we're going to agree that Korea should be made free and independent. Uh, That'll be an issue later too during the Cold War because the Koreans, uh, the Korean Peninsula there is one of the places where the uh, tension between the Soviet Union and the Americans is at its greatest. We're actually going to see some surrogate fighting there in the Korean War, right? The northern portion will end up being communist and the southern portion will end up being uh, democratic and capitalist. And so, uh, you know, this idea of a free and independent uh, Korea is going to uh, ultimately lead to, uh, you know, the division of the Korean Peninsula and, uh, you know, uh, escalation of the Cold War. All right. So 
The next big conference is going to be Yalta in 45. Uh, Yalta is uh, the last conference that is going to include FDR. Uh, this is again is the big three. It's FDR from the United States, Winston Churchill from Great Britain, and Joseph Stalin from the Soviet Union. Uh, and at Yalta, the, we're going to come to uh, several different agreements here. The first is that the Japanese and the Germans uh, can be tried as war criminals. Uh, this idea that the you know the rape of Nanking by the Japanese is uh, you know beyond the pale. That we're we're just not going to accept that in war anymore. You can't just go around and kill all the men and rape all the women. Uh, and that clearly that the Holocaust is a war crime and. And we're going to try and deter that by making sure that the, the proper people are being pun uh, punished. Uh, we're also going to agree to the creation of the UN. Now, Churchill and FDR had talked about this earlier during the Atlantic Charter, right? And so we had talked about that in a previous lecture. It's getting formalized here at Yalta. And so they're agreeing to make it. Now we're going to talk about another conference later in this lecture where they actually hammer out the details. That's going to be in San Francisco. But Yalta is where the big three agree, okay, we're going to have some sort of international body. And that's important because these are the three most powerful leaders in the world. And if you don't get all three of them to sign on to an international agreement for an international governing body, uh, it'll fail just like the League of Nations did. And so uh, that's going to be super important. So it evolved out of the Atlantic Charter. Uh, the uh, Russians are going to once again confirm that they're going to fight uh, the Japanese, but Stalin is going to make additional demands to uh, the West. And he's essentially going to say, look, uh, again, we will reaffirm that we will fight the Japanese once we're done fighting the Germans, which Berlin falls like a couple months after this. Uh, the but he's going to want something for that, and he's going to demand that he gets all the land that Russia lost in the Russo-Japanese War previously back, and uh, the, the West will essentially agree to that. Now, uh, the Soviet Union will actually declare war on Japan, and they'll actually do it quicker than the two months that they said they would do it in, uh, but that's only because it's made moot because America drops atomic weapons on uh, Japan. And so, uh, you know, the, the Soviets don't really do any significant fighting against Japan because we uh, dropped the bomb. And so uh, they're also, and this is probably the most important thing that happens out of Yalta, is the that at Yalta they're going to agree to divide Germany into four zones. Uh, and the capital, Berlin, into four zones as well. And, uh, you know, each of the world, major world powers are going to get a section. So uh, the British will have a section, the Americans will have a section, the Soviets will have a section, and then the French will have a section. So it's not really the four biggest powers in the world uh, at the time. France is no longer that. It's the traditional four biggest powers are going to get a zone in, in Berlin. And the idea is is divide up Germany and each country will be in charge of controlling their portion. And that will keep Germany, uh, you know, from being internationally aggressive again. Um, now, uh, this is going to be important later because the uh, British, French, and Americans are real, really quickly going to realize that uh, a divided Germany is not good for the West, That uh, and they're going to unify their three zones. The Soviets won't. The Soviets want Germany as weak as possible, and they know that if they leave Germany, Germany will end up being a capitalist democracy and their enemy, and so uh, the Soviets won't relinquish uh, their zone until the absolute end of the Cold War. And, uh, you know, and as a matter of fact, they're, they're actually going to try and blockade Berlin when America, Great Britain, and France unite their zone.
So uh, Stalin will promise that in his sections that they'll give, they'll have free and fair elections. They will have elections. They will neither be free nor fair. And, uh, you know, he will install a puppet government on uh, the uh, eastern uh, side of Berlin and Germany. Uh, interestingly enough, and we'll talk about this in the next lecture, uh, this becomes a... Uh, a real science experiment, uh, social science experiment between uh, different competing economic philosophies, capitalism and communism, right? You, it's really hard to compare apples to apples, you know, these two different economic systems, but in Germany, we'll be able to do that because half will be capitalist, half will be communist. Uh, the capitalist half will thrive uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll see, you know, a tremendous growth in wealth, uh, you know, the shrinking of poverty and increase in the standard of living. And on the communist side where, you know, they talk about the, you know, the equality and the egalitarianism of, of communism, what you'll see really is famine and, you know, a basic, uh, you know, a lack of basic needs. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, it really becomes a, a desperate kind of situation on the, the communist side, on the eastern side of, of Germany. Uh, but more about that later. All right, uh, these are your zones. Uh, so it, when you take a look on um, what's my left, I'm assuming that's your left too, as you're looking at this, uh, you can see Germany as a whole and the, the four sectors. And then uh, right above the picture here, that's Berlin uh, in the four sectors. And you can see that uh, Berlin is uh, divided into four sectors of the same powers. Uh, but I hope you notice uh, something that Berlin is completely surrounded in the Soviet section. And so that's going to be important later because when the Western powers unify their section, that means Berlin is because Berlin is in the Soviet section that Berlin can be held hostage by the Soviets. They can essentially shut down all the roads and canals into Berlin uh, and starve Berlin. And th that's what's going to happen. Uh, you'll also notice that when we're taking a look here, that in Berlin, there's uh, oh, that white line. That will be the Berlin Wall. And we'll talk about that more in uh, the, the next lecture as well. The Berlin Wall uh, unlike the Iron Curtain, is an actual wall. And uh, again, it's because of the difference between capitalism and communism. Uh, the, the economy it thrives on the Western section of the wall uh, in the, the, the capitalist side, and the economy is just tanks in the, the communist side. And so the wall gets put up to keep people in because nobody wants to stay in the communist section because everybody's just like poor and miserable and, you know, can't find toilet paper. Um, and then that's true. So, uh, you know, the wall has to get put up to keep people in, but we'll, we'll, we'll discuss more of that in a, a future lecture. So the next conference we're going to talk about, uh, I mentioned previously, is uh, at San Francisco. San Francisco is going to be one of the larger conferences. There's going to be 50 different nations uh, involved there. This is the largest international gathering ever up until this point in history. Uh, and the purpose is to establish the United Nations, to come up with the rules, the charter, you know, how's it all going to work uh, and how are we going to figure it out. Um, 80 percent of the world's governments are going to be represented at this uh, this conference, and so uh, this is a, a huge thing here. And so, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to create this uh, governing body that actually has some teeth. It's going to be able to, unlike the League of Nations, it's going to be able to, uh, you know, punish and fine uh, the. You know, the, any uh, nations that don't follow its resolution. So it can actually, it, it is a voting, uh, you know, semi-democratic body where they can pass resolutions to say things like, you know, you can't 
commit genocide. Uh, and if countries do that, they can be punished either economically, they'll also have a, a military force to be able to enforce uh, the their resolutions. And so, you know, they kind of are learning their from their mistakes from the League of Nations. Uh, the General Assembly is the 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 main body that's going to, uh, you know, write and pass resolutions. Uh, but to get the major world powers on board here, uh, they're, you know, they, they're going to want us some control over the general general assembly. And so what they will create to make sure that, you know, American sovereignty isn't, uh, you know, at risk is they'll create a security council. And so the security council has five permanent members and some rotating members. The five permanent members uh, have veto power. And so Great Britain, France, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China uh, will all insist that they have veto power at uh, within the security council. And so anything that gets passed has to go through the security council. And so if, if they pass Pass some law that's bad for America, America can just veto it. Uh, and then there'll be an executive branch to the UN as well, uh, where the leader uh, that's in charge of like enforcing all these uh, the resolutions uh, is referred to as the secretariat. So Security Council, five permanent members with veto power. Those members are United States, Great Britain, France, Soviet Union, and China. And then uh, besides uh, that, there's a whole series of other uh, different uh, you know, committees that are established. There's an international court of justice. There's, you know, uh, committees on, uh, you know, there's the, the World Health Organization, other organizations like that. So uh, this is the flag of the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations will be located in New York City. And so, you know, that's a big PR win for America. It kind of makes America this like central, uh, you know, authority uh, when it comes to international politics. A big part of that is we foot a, a huge part of the bill here. Uh, but again, it's a, a part of being, you know, the big boy and, and the superpower. So uh, the General Assembly, like I said, com is comprised of every member nation. Uh, they debate, make resolutions. Uh, you know, they can form special agencies and, and, and do those things as well. Uh, the UN, uh, the leader uh, of the executive side is referred to as the Secretariat. And uh, they're responsible for executing all the decisions and, and carrying out those tasks. Uh, it's just like the executive, similar, I should say, not just like, but similar uh, to, uh, you know, the normal executive branches in democracies. Um, the International Court of Justice is a part of the UN, and it's uh, designed to decide cases between different nations if there's disputes there, uh, just like a normal court system. And so instead of the two countries, you know, having a problem with each other and, and going to war, they could take it to the UN where they can get, you know, what they're supposed to get is a uh, fair hearing and, uh, you know, a diplomatic resolution of the problem so we don't have to rely on war as much. Uh, there's other organizations that are part of the UN, uh, you know, UNESCO, which is the United Nations Education, Science, Cultural Organization, the World Health Organization, uh, which is a big deal right now as the whole coronavirus pandemic is, is going on. And so, you know, the the UN is just designed to deal with international issues. The next conference that we're going to talk about is uh, the conference at Potsdam. Uh, this is uh, this conference at Potsdam. This is a big one. This is the last of the big three. Uh, FDR died a, a couple uh, months after Yalta. And so Truman has taken over. This one is going to be Stalin, Churchill, and Truman. And uh, this conference is going to have a, a large impact again on uh, post-war 
uh, you know, uh, post-war Europe. Uh, they're going to decide, first of all, to relocate 6.5 million uh, Germans out of places like uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland. Uh, the idea there is put them all back in Germany because when one of the reasons Hitler justified going to war was to, uh, you know, to to reunite all the German people under one German government. He was saying that Germans were being mistreated in these other countries and, uh, you know, that 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 was his justification for going to war. So we want to be able to take that away. Uh, they're also going to agree to, uh, you know, a uh, you know, military control over Germany at Potsdam. And they also decide that the best thing to make sure that Germany doesn't get aggressive again is to take away their industry and force them into an agricultural economy. Now, ultimately, they won't do this. Uh, both sides, and we'll talk about this more in the, the lecture tomorrow, uh, the... Uh, they, they'll choose not to do this. Even Stalin will choose not to do this uh, for their own personal reasons. Uh, and, and we'll go into detail in, in the next lecture. Uh, Potsdam is also where Truman uh, tells Churchill and Stalin about the bomb. Remember, he kind of glosses over it with Stalin, which is going to cause some bad blood there. Uh, but with Churchill, he actually explains like, hey, look, we're going to drop this bomb uh, and it's going to be a game changer. All right. Uh, the last conference we're going to talk about today uh, is the uh, conference at Washington, D.C. Uh, this one is going to have uh, 11 uh, countries be involved in it. They're mostly, uh, you know, uh, Eastern countries, and they're going to uh, talk about the how we're going to run Japan and and you know America occupying Japan, rewriting its constitution, which ends up being a really uh, pretty good one. You know, giving women the right to vote and, and increasing suffrage, and you know, uh, turning Japan essentially into a capitalist democracy. Or, you know, the Japanese are going to get freedom of the press, uh, like I said, women's suffrage, uh, the right to unionize, uh, and uh, they're going to kind of work out the details uh, of how Japan is going to be run at Washington, D.C. All right, uh, that concludes our lecture for today. Uh, I appreciate your time, and I'll see you again soon.